Today is the second day of the Kingdom Search. Amen. And yes, and Wednesday is when we started the Kingdom Search. This is going to be a yearly program. Every year, between Passover and Pentecost, we're going to be doing teachings on the Holy Spirit. I mean, on the Kingdom of God. Amen. This is going to be established for all of time in this church. Amen. Because the Bible says in Acts 1, verse 3, that when Jesus rose from the dead after his passion, he went up, provided eternal redemption, and he came down, appeared to the disciples for 40 days. And for 40 days, he taught the disciples of things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Amen. We can start the recording. Amen. Hallelujah. So, Acts 1, 3 says, for for 40 days, Jesus taught these guys about the kingdom of God. Interestingly, when Jesus was alive on the earth as a son of man, he was teaching the disciples, the multitudes, everybody who would listen about the kingdom of God. His first message, the title of his sermon was repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That was his first sermon. And he ended his sermons by saying, that this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. Then, then shall the end come. I want you guys to spend time reading Matthew 24. When you read Matthew 24, you see the different stages of the end time. There are things that occasion the end time. There are things that are the beginning of sorrows. And there are things that just will say that then shall the end come. So the other things that were said about the end time were just the beginning of sorrows. But when the kingdom of God is preached, that is what will occasion the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now the kingdom of God is being preached. Amen. The word has been given. And as a ministry, God has given us the mandate. Hallelujah. To restore the message and to restore not just the word of it, but the ministry, the power aspects of the kingdom of God. Say word and deed. Amen. We don't want to just become word, word, word. The Bible says the kingdom of God is not in word, it is in power. In fact, in Mark 9, verse 1, Jesus said that some standing in that will not taste of death until they see the kingdom of God come with power. There must be a demonstration. Paul said, I don't preach with enticing words of man's wisdom. But in the demonstration of the Holy Ghost and power. So the power of God is what executes the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. And we need to see this dynamic. Hallelujah. Amen. See, Father, give me understanding. Give me understanding. Open my eyes. Amen. Open my ears. Amen. To understand the kingdom of God. Amen. To see it. Amen. To hear it. Amen. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and the book that we use for our study is the book of Matthew. So for this year, we're using the book of Matthew in our kingdom study. Amen. And then next year, if we did finish with Matthew this year, we'll continue with Mark. Amen. If we didn't finish, we'll continue from where we left off. This way, we'll go all around Dorn. It will go all around Kabul and Chapel Hill. Amen. We'll send this word everywhere we can send it. We'll see these every which way. The kingdom must be spread abroad. The kingdom must be preached in all the nations for a witness. And that is when the kingdom will what? come. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. For us to truly understand the kingdom, we must understand that we are kings and priests. Amen. This identity is very critical. You see, God is a king. You know that God, one of his identities is that he, he sits on the throne. He's seen in heaven sitting on the throne, the one that's seated on a throne. In Daniel 7, he's sitting on a throne. In Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel chapter 8, he's traveling on a portable throne. In Revelation chapter 1, after chapter 4, he sees the Father God sitting on the throne looking like a jasper and sardine stone and the elders sitting around him 
bowing down to him and all of heaven worshiping him. Amen. And in the beginning of time, in Genesis 1, when the Father began to create the earth, he spoke and acted as a king. He commands and he speaks. That's where the word of a king is. There is power. So God doesn't ask, he doesn't pray. He speaks. He decrees. He makes orders. Amen. And, and that is how we are to be. Amen. A king issues commands and issues orders. A priest offers prayers. Amen. Intercedes on behalf of sinners. Makes intercession for people. Represents people to God. A priest, his activity is around the house of God. Amen. Are you listening to this? I want us to understand who a king is versus who a priest is. And you will realize that most of what we have been doing in the church is mostly in a priestly mindset. And very little, if any, has been done in the church concerning our primary, original identity, which is that of a king. See, I was born to be a king. In, a, in our new birth, in our new birth as new creatures, we are what? Kings. And the Bible says, seek you first the kingdom of God. And what will happen? All these things shall be added. So anything else that we deal with is an addition to the kingdom of God. The priesthood was what? Added to the kingdom of God. So priesthood always comes after the kingdom. But what we've done is that we have dealt with the priesthood first. And as a result, we have become very churchy, very priestly. And we have to understand that tonight. Because today God wants you to become a king. And as this identity becomes more and more defined in your life, you will see circumstances around you beginning to change. Hallelujah. You will deal with problems differently from everybody else. You will see that you are becoming like Jesus Christ. The Bible says they noticed that Jesus Christ was different. The way he spoke was different. He spoke with authority. Shout authority. The kingdom of God is a sovereign will. The sovereign rule, dominion and power of God coming from where? Heaven. To the earth. To take back that which was first given to man. Amen. And when the kingdom of heaven comes down to the earth, it displaces the kingdom of darkness. Amen. So the good news of the kingdom of God is that, hello, the kingdom of heaven has come. And anything on the earth that doesn't line up with heaven is going to change. Amen. So in heaven, when you go there, there's healing for the nations. There is no curse. Amen. The devil, Satan, was cast out of the third heavens. So when the kingdom of God comes, what is in heaven comes down on the earth. I believe that is good news. It is not bad news. It is good news. Shout somebody, it is good news. Amen. Hallelujah. And we have to understand the full dimension of what it means to be a priest to better understand what it means to be a king. You understand this? When you look into the Bible carefully, the priests in Exodus chapter 28, they were to be anointed to minister in the priest's office. And they were anointed to serve in the tabernacle. Shout tabernacle. And they were to serve in the church, in the house of God, in the sanctuary. Amen. Their activities were exclusively centered around the sanctuary. Alright. And they were not to leave that place. And God told the priest that they were his heritage. And he gave them the offerings, the first fruits of Israel to be their food so that they won't have to go and work and be involved in civilian activities. You understand this? So the priests were separated from the people. The Bible says that Jesus became a high priest, separate from sinners. Amen. He, he was set apart. In fact, the priest had a crown on his head, some kind of a turban, and on it had been written, holiness unto the Lord, set apart for God. And the priest, his job was to minister in the house of God. See the priest. His job is to minister in the house of God in things pertaining to God. 
He is to offer up prayers, gifts, and sacrifices. All right, so whenever you hear about the priest, his function is house of God, the church. You understand this? If I let's go to Hebrews chapter 8. Hallelujah. In, in Hebrews, if you really want to understand priesthood, you got to be in the book of Hebrews a lot. Amen? Because Hebrews really breaks down what the priest is. Amen. Glory be to God in this place. Hebrews chapter 8. Are we there? Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sound. We have such a high priest. Who is this high priest? Jesus. Who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. Verse 2. A minister of the sanctuary. Say a priest. is a minister of the sanctuary or the house of God. The church. So you see that God is defining the role of a priest. He ministers in the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord pitched and not man. Hallelujah. So Moses pitched a tent. David pitched a tent. But Jesus has also pitched a tent. He says you tear this temple down and in three days I will build it back up again. Amen. They said it took us 46 years to build it. How can you build it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. He was speaking of the temple of what? His body. And the body of Christ is what? The church. The Bible says he's giving him to be the head of all things to the church, which is his body. The fullness of him that filleth all in all. So the body of Christ is the church and is the temple. So Peter says we all like living stones are being fitted together to offer our sacrifices to God. That is all priesthood. So as priests, we are stones in the temple of God. We all offer our sacrifices. See, I'm a living stone in the house of God. So priesthood has to be defined. Verse 3, a high priest or a priest is ordained. He is put in place. He is appointed to do what? To offer gifts and sacrifices. Amen. So a high priest or a priest, he offers prayers. He offers sacrifices. Amen. That is one thing he does in the house of God. So when you go to the Moses tabernacle, which is a copy and a type of the true tabernacle, you see that there were three compartments. But the first compartment, whose light was the sun, moon, and stars, the, the, the altar, there was the brazen altar. And only they offer the sin offerings, the trespass offering, the peace meal offerings, the thanksgiving offerings, amen, the burnt offering, it all took place on that altar. Amen. If a man sin, if you read Leviticus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, when you read all of that, you see what happens. A man will sin. And when he knows that he has sinned, he gets a goat. And then he takes this goat to the tabernacle, gives it to the priest. The priest takes it. They kill it and, and they put their hand on the head of the goat and put the sin on the goat. You see this? And then the priest has a share of the, of the goat and the rest of the sacrifice. At times, something would have happened in the house of that man who bring a, a burnt offering, a thanksgiving, peace offerings. And everyone, the priest had a share of it. You understand this? So the, the priest's job was to be there to receive the sacrifices and offer it on behalf of the whole congregation. When the whole nation sinned, it was a priest's job to offer sacrifices to cover the whole sin for the whole nation. So his job was to minister to the infirmities and the afflictions and the sins of the people. When, when the Israelites were complaining against Moses, if you read the Bible, a plague came into the temple, came into the, um, um, Israel and began to kill them. And Moses told Aaron, you need to take your censor and go and burn it. So he took the censer and the Bible says where he stood and he began to burn the incense behind him were dead people. But in front of him were living people. So his ministry stopped death. That's how powerful the priesthood is. So the house of God is a refuge. And when you come to the house of God, the enemy, the avenger cannot come inside with you. This is God's family. This is his, 
his sitting room. This is his living room. Amen. This is his secret place. This is his house. And in the house of God, Satan has no jurisdiction over them. He has no jurisdiction over them. He may try to interfere. But Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Because the house of God is, has been built by Jesus Christ himself. It is the true tabernacle. The enemy cannot mess up with it. Amen. The only thing that can happen is when we allow things to happen. Amen. That's how we learn today by removing the old living. If you allow the living of darkness, the old living, the living of malice, the living of insincerity, if you allow the living of wickedness to prevail, the house can be afflicted. Laziness can also mess up the house of God. Ecclesiastes says that by laziness of the hands, the roof drips. So if we are lazy as ministers, not praying, not ministering, not, not ministering around the altar like Joel chapter 1 and chapter 2, if we are lazy about the things of God, the cave, the roof can break it. Amen. And, and, and you notice that in the book of 1 Samuel, the priests were sleeping with women in the house of God. And the Bible says that the offerings that came in, they will partake of it before they give it to God. So that brought the wrath of God to the house of God. And the Bible says, God prophesied, released a word that an enemy will come into the camp and destroy the house. So the house of God, so far as God's will and purpose is being done, it cannot be destroyed. But when we allow certain things to come in and we, and we mess up our part of our responsibility, the things can go down south. But as far as it's, it depends on God, the devil has tried many times to destroy the church. There are churches that have been burned to the ground with the people in it. Amen. All of us, especially in the Muslim world, they burn in churches. All right, the church is under attack in America. Even our president is not saying nice things about Christianity. Amen. In Britain, where the Muslims have, have almost taken over, Cameroon says this is a Christian nation. But here our president says this is not a Christian nation. All right? Christianity is under attack. All right? But I have good news for you. This church wasn't built by Moses. This church wasn't built by Herod. God, Jesus Christ himself built it. The church is the body of Christ. And Jesus said, I was dead. And now I'm alive. And I'm alive forevermore. Nothing can destroy the church. Nothing can destroy the church. In fact, we are the restraining force on the enemy. So Thessalonians says that even the man of iniquity, the son of perdition, can't do anything until, the, until that which restraints is removed. Yeah. We are the restriction force. We are the injunction of heaven on the earth. Amen. Amen. So as long as the church is tied up or joined to the head and acting right, we'll still be here. Amen. Amen. And if we mess up, you take the lampstand and find other people. Because the church is not going to be destroyed. Yes. A local expression can be destroyed, yes, yes. but the church universal keeps on growing. Yes. <laughs> I don't know whether you heard it. Yes. A head can fall out of your head, but another one pop right there. Yes. You can cut off your nails, it will come back up again. Yes. It's not the same cells, it's another cell that came up. Mm -hmm. A cell can die in your body and come out like dust. But more cells are multiplied inside your body. Are you listening? So the body of Christ is ever living. It can't die. And God begins to put certain things in the church to get the church going. Are you listening to this? So let's go on to um, 1 Corinthians. Amen. Are you listening to this word? Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about the body of Christ. Thank you very much. The Bible says in verse 12, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 12. Are we all there? What is the body? It's the body of Christ. The body of Christ is what? It's the church. Is it? For as the body is one and have many members, all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Verse 24. For our commonly parts have no need for let's start from verse 23. Oh, one day we'll talk about this. Do you know God himself is involved in your body 
Whenever you talk about God, God is always there. God is always involved in our existence. So even the body, God has his fingerprints all over this body. He puts Adam's body together. Yes. And the Bible says, the body thou has prepared for me. So let's look at some intricacies about how God formed this body. Verse 23. And those members of the body, which we think to be less honorable, hmm, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncommonly parts have more abundant commonliness. Verse 24. For our commonly parts have no need. But God has, what has he done? God put this body together. He tempered this body. He fashioned, he puts you in this church to perform a critical function. If you don't perform your function, the whole church suffers. Are you listening to this? Amen. We are all part of this body. When you have a headache, and it's very, very bad. You lie in bed, your feet can't move. Your feet is fully functional, but the headache is messing up even your foot. If your foot is hurting you, the head can't move fast. The head is slowed down by the foot. Are you getting it? In the same way, you are a member of this body. Amen. God has tempered the body together. Give more honor to the part that would lack. So the part that nobody sees, maybe all you do is pray for the pastor. I hope you pray for me though. I know you do, amen. Maybe you have made your point that every day I'll pray one hour for the pastor. I don't even know about it. But heaven knows about what you're doing. Okay, it's, it's a secret thing. There's more honor on you because of the secret nature of it. People think holding the mic and preaching that is obvious. That is conspicuous. And that is beautiful. Because the pastors normally we dress with all this stuff and you know we have all these robes, amen. And we have all these mice, amen. And, and, and every pastor we have our own handkerchief, some like blue ones, some like white ones, amen. We have long flowing gowns, amen. And we have the mic. And we stand before everybody. Amen. And we think that is the most powerful. But there's somebody, if he stops praying, chairs are empty. Nothing happens. Amen. Amen. There are people that are holding the kingdom of God together who are not seen. Yes. Mm -hmm. And God has given them more glory. Yes. Amen. Because things done in secret attract the glory of God. Amen. Amen. But I'm coming to one point. Verse 27. Are we there? Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Can we read verse 28 together? God has set some in the church. First, apostles. Secondarily, prophets, teachers, miracles, healings, Helps, governments, diverse of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? So, all these things, where did they function? In the church, in the body of Christ. And what is the church? The sanctuary of God. It is the holy place, it is the house of God. Anything connected to the body of Christ. Anything connected to the sanctuary of God is under the title priesthood. You need to get this point. Amen. It's very important that you understand this. Amen. Hallelujah. Do we need to cement this some more? All right. Let's go to Titus. Actually, First Timothy, First Timothy three, verse fifteen. What does it say? But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how to thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. What is the house of God? Am I convincing you today? The house of God is what? See, house of God 
is the church. So when they speak about the house of God in the Old Testament, they spoke about the tabernacle. They spoke about um, Solomon's temple. Solomon, when he prayed, he says, if anybody comes to this house and prays, hear their cry. So the church is not just today. The church has been existing from Moses' days to this very day. Amen. In fact, Jacob called Bethel, the, the place where he encountered God. He called it what? That was the first church there. You see in this? So any place where sacrifices are made, altars are made, amen, prayers are made, sacrifices, all that is what? Priestly. Because the priesthood connects us to God. So if you are a king, your priesthood is what connects you to God. When David was in trouble at Ziklag and his own men were about to fight him and kill him. Bible says he encouraged himself in the Lord and then he asked for what? The effort. And he began to inquire. That was priesthood. Do you understand this? And when he received instruction from heaven, pursue, overtake, recover all, he takes off the effort. What do you think he put on this? He put on this armor. Hallelujah. He's no longer in the priesthood mode. He has shifted to the kingly mode, which is his original mode. Amen. So he used the priesthood to what? Connect. Receive instruction. But to step out of the house of God to deal with the problem which is outside the house, he has to shift to his kingly mode to engage the enemy. You can't engage the enemy in your priesthood. Amen. Moses said, Joshua, you go and fight. I'll go to the mountain. I'm going to connect. And then you go and fight. The Bible says, send out Joshua with Eleazar, the priest. So when Joshua will go to what the priest will go with him, just to keep them clean and keep them whole. Amen. But really, he, his job was not to fight. His job was to encourage. Shout encourage. Hallelujah. There's a, there's a chapter in Deuteronomy allowed where the Bible says before the war begins, the priests will come and stand in front of the army and say, guys, you're going to fight a big time army. Yeah, the enemy may look big and fat and strong, but I'm telling you that God is going ahead of you. Hallelujah. God is with you. The priests will preach. Hallelujah. And, and encourage the, the, the heart of those people. And I can see the people spirits lifting up. He will tell them, God is with you. You can't fail. His angels are well ahead of you. We have prayed for you today. The blood has been spilled. You will win this battle. And then he will move. Amen. And then the captains will come. Alright. That was nice. Uh, if you are here and you are afraid, hit the road. Amen. That's a different person. He says, if you are here in this house and you're scared, go home. He says, if you just married a woman and your mind is on your wife, go, 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 leave. Now, if you just got a business and your mind is still on that, go. Amen. And then he will charge the people up and take them. You see the difference? A king goes out to fight. See, the king goes out of the house to fight. Amen. So, every time we've been in a church, we taught apostles and prophets and all these other ministries were really kingdom. That is really priesthood. They were given to the church. Amen. In fact, they were, you were called to be a pastor or a teacher before you got saved. I know that's so hard to believe. When was Jeremiah called to be a prophet? His mother's womb. Is that in your Bible? So before Jeremiah was born, he was called a prophet. Have you heard that before? So all these giftings, we, we, we come from our mother's womb with these gifts. I was a teacher of the Bible as a teenager, even before I became a teenager. My, my pop, he would do a Bible study at home. Very, very great man of God. Very great man. He trained us in the Bible. Amen. Amen. And then we'll sit together as a family every morning and every evening. Every morning. 
My pop will call us all out. We'll sit around, we'll read the passage, we'll all pray, stuff like that. Then you ask questions, and I was always talking. I mean, I, 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 was, I was the guy who had an answer for everything. I was always, I was, I had every question. You have no problem, and Paul, and you would, you would let, let, let your sister also talk. <laughs> I was that kind of person. So I've always been like this. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. His father was a pastor. All right. So it was, it was normal. And I wasn't the best of guys. All right. I wasn't the best guy. Amen. I had my issues. But he put me in front of a pulpit. I wrote. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. And I, can, I can go out there and still party. Amen. And you put me in front of a pulpit, I can still run. Hallelujah. And step out and go for a party. And come back and I can lead prayer. And I can charge you up. And go out there and still party. Thank God that he saved me. Yeah. Amen. Oh, God saved me. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm not even comfortable in the party setting. I'm not comfortable in the party setting. That's, that's salvation, isn't it? Yeah. Amen. But the point I'm making to you is that I could do all of this. Before I really got saved, truly saved. Amen. And the enemy is able to look at people coming into the well, and he, he has an ability to scan the, the memory files of people and be able to determine that this person has come up with something. I mean, they, they knew something was coming down when Moses was born. That's why they said, Let's kill everybody. They, they, they didn't know exactly who, but they knew somebody. I come down with something. You understand this? So the enemy has an ability to tell what your destiny is. Yes. Amen. Amen. And, and, and if he can't kill you, the next thing he tries to do is to pervert it. Amen. So some people are born and they have dreams and they can foretell, they can see into things. If they say, Mama, your, your mama is going to die in a week. In a week, the person is going to die. So they call the person psychic. And it's unconscious, some of those people are taken over and they, they become the chief priest or the shaman like in the Indian world. Or the, if you go to London, Europe, the Druids. All right? Every society has those medicine men, those guys who act crazy but seem to have a connection to the other world. Amen? They can do all kinds of things. You are born with it. And if it's not harnessed and employed in the church, it can get corrupted and be used by Satan for very evil means. So when you're born again, you're born again from whose womb? God's womb. Amen? Well, you come with different gifts from the gifts that you bring from your mother's womb. You come with different gifts. We call it the gift of a king. The Bible says that he's king of Kings, and every king has their own manifestations. There are many different gifts that a king walks in. Amen. And a king has anointing. Can I hear a big amen? amen? Hallelujah. So when Jesus was born, what did he say? Because he was born from above. He came from above. You know that. Jesus came from heaven to the earth. He says that the first Adam came from the earth. The second Adam came from. He's a man from heaven. From heaven. So coming from heaven, what did he come with? Glory be to God in this place. Can we go to John 18? Amen. Amen. And look, if you want to catch up to where we are or to actually go ahead of us, you need to buy all the kingdom messages you can get your hands on. Amen. Amen. You know our spiritual father is Apostle David Taylor? You need to go on his website, Joshua Media Ministries.org. Buy anything you see kingdom on it. Buy anything you see. Any CD he has out there that has kingdom on it, I bought it. Anything that has kingdom, I buy it. You understand this? Go, go online, buy it up, buy it up. Those revelations are keys from heaven. And as you feed on it, and if you are faithful in the way you listen to it, God begin to open your eyes and give you more based on what you listen to. He says, if you are faithful in the letter of what we do, he'll give you more. Amen. So if you buy it, you will learn more. 
Because as a church, this is our mandate to restore the what the message and the that's our mandate. It's on the wall. Let's all read it. Restoring the message and ministry. Aha. Uh -huh. We are not just message people, but what also? Ministry. ministry. Manifesting the power of God. Amen. John chapter 18. John 18. Are we on John 18? Hallelujah. Verse 35. Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thy own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What have you done? What has thou done? I want us all to be verse 36. See, when I was born again, from heaven, I came with a gift. Kingdom gift. But when I was born from my mother's womb, I was born with callings on my life. Amen. Amen. So this higher calling from heaven is much more powerful than the one you got from your mother's womb, isn't it? Are you understanding this? All right. Okay. Verse 36. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servant fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now it's Verse 37, Pilate therefore said to him, Adam a king, then Jesus answered, Thou sayest, I am a king. To this end, to this end, this is why I was born. And for this cause came I into this world. That I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth, hear my voice. Pilate is so confused, what this word is true. <laughs> Jesus doesn't need to explain himself. That's one thing I like about Jesus. I learned that from him. He doesn't worry about explaining himself to people. You know, I see a lot of people trying to explain themselves to people. Do you, do you realize that the more you explain yourself, the more you the more the more you they can, they can have more things to hit you on. Don't worry about what people think about you. Be who you are. Amen. You are the best you that there is. Notice that what Joel Austin says. You are the best you that there is. And that's true. There's nobody like you. There's nobody that can smile like you. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, nobody can frown like you. Hallelujah. Amen. Nobody has the kind of head shape you have. Right. It's only you have this design. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Some people, their hands are so small. So cute. Some of their hands are so big. When you look at them, all you see is their hand. <laughs> but that helped Kwahi Leonard, that, that spares guy. Have you seen his hand before? <laughs> Huge. That gave him his role. Amen. Amen. Anos Swaziga. Amen. See how he speaks. Mm -hmm. Like a robot. Mm -hmm. That gave him all the roles. Mm -hmm. Who's that love? He's done. <laughs> I'm coming back again. Amen. He doesn't talk too much. All he does is just take off his shirt and rip off some muscles. And, and that's it. Amen. God made you and designed you to do something that nobody else could do. Amen. Amen. The devil may think he has figured you out. But there's something you came to the earth with. Amen. That he's working so hard to stop you from manifesting. Amen. That is your occasion. The whole controversy about Jesus Christ was his, around his birth. And around his death. Was that he was a king. And when he was alive. They kept asking, why are you doing this? What authority do you have to do this? Who gave you the power to do this? They were fighting his authority, his kingship. When he was born, why did they want to kill him? He was born to be a king. They, they went to Pilate and they said, Pilate, this man is confusing the people. He said, is that, is that what you got? He said, this man is teaching us bad things. Says, this is your law stuff. This is church stuff. This is your problem. Go and solve your problem. 
I'm not interested. The devil doesn't is not scared about the priesthood aspect of him. That doesn't scare him. Guess what? He can take over and birth his own kids inside the church. So in John 8, Jesus says to the pastors of the church then, your father is not God. Your father is Satan. And his last is what he wanted to do. So somehow the church had come, I mean, Satan had come to the church and buried his own kids. Kingdom is what he's scared of. Because Satan, you don't know read about Satan having a church. He has a kingdom. And the only anointing that can counteract him is the anointing of a king, not the anointing of a priest. The anointing of the priest is defensive. Hallelujah. It's to provide a place of refuge. But for us to go out and inherit the land, you got to go as a king. Otherwise, you stay in your tiny hole somewhere and make all the noise. Pilate is, uh, if, I'm not concerned about that. I mean, the priests were protected by who? The Romans. They were not threatened by that. The one of the priests said, it looks like our arguments are not working. Everything we're saying, so far as it's in the priesthood, it doesn't worry about it. It's a party. This guy is calling himself a king. He says, bring me. Let's go and talk. Is that in your Bible? Yeah. As soon as they brought the aspect of a king, they brought him in. And you know, even after he tried him, he says, guys, I still don't find anything wrong with him. And say, hey, Pilot, don't forget this. If you're not careful, we'll call your boss. Any man who calls himself a king is fighting against Caesar. Pilot said, go and kill him. <laughs> the reason why Jesus was crucified was that he was a king. Not because he was a teacher. Not because he was teaching false doctrines. Not because uh, of anything. What got him was that he was a king. And that was a problem for Pilot. That was the problem for Caesar. Any person who calls himself a king is fighting against the Roman government. That is the only thing the devil is scared of. The kingdom. Amen. It worries him. But if you come against him as an apostle, that's fine. Amen. You come to him as a teacher, it's okay. He can handle that. He can give you a sermon, actually. Amen. But when you come to him as a king, he gets really worried. That messes him up. He can't handle the kingdom. Mm -hmm. He can't handle the king. Jesus didn't beg him to leave him. He says, Satan gets the heads. That wasn't a begging. He commanded him, get the heads. And the devil left. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. The Bible says, when, when we went to Titus, that the that the, that the house of God is the church, the pillar of truth. The kings, we came with a different level of anointing. And that anointing is more powerful than that of a priest. And many people, <laughs> oh, God is good, amen, hallelujah. But do you realize that the priest is not as powerful as the king? The king is more powerful. Because the king is first. It says we are what? Kings and priests unto God. You are first a king and then you are what? A priest. Your function as a king comes first. And when you begin to think like a king, you will see fantastic things begin to happen in your life. Amen. 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 And when you get into your identity as a king, then you must understand who you are as a king. As a king, you have a throne. Amen? Amen. To execute judgment. The throne is established on what? Righteousness and judgment. And as a king, you have a scepter. Amen? Amen? And as a king, your powers are in your mouth. Where the word of a king is, there is power. In fact, your eyes have power. The Bible says he scattered all evil with his eyes. Even his clothes carry power. Amen. He says, wait in Jerusalem until he be endued with power.
power from on high. The word and you means clothed. So even the clothes that came from Paul's hand, without him being there, who cast them was out. Mm -hmm. So as a king, even your clothes have majesty in it, have powers in it. Somebody can touch it, and the electricity goes through them, and they are healed. Even your shadow as a king can heal people. Are you listening to what we are saying? As a king, you must know what your powers are. And the crown is where you see, that's where they transfer. If you say you are taking the kingdom of Durham, what that means is that the crown of Durham must be taken from somebody's head. So when you receive a crown, that means that somebody has been dethroned. So when the king of Edom was defeated, David took his crown and put it on his head. That signified the transfer of authority and the transfer of power from one kingdom to another kingdom. So when you read the book of Revelations in chapter 6, the Bible says, a man on a white horse came and was given a crown and he went conquering and to conquer. Can I hear a big amen? A king goes out to do what? To fight. Not a priest. But when Jesus went out in Revelation 19, he sits on a white horse. The first time we hear about Jesus is called the prince of the kings of the earth. The next time we hear he's called king of kings and lord of lords because at this point there were many crowns on his head. He had conquered. He had won the battle. I'm here to win some battles. I'm here to win some battles. I'm here to win some battles. We're coming for the crowns. We're coming for the crown of Adoro. Amen. We're taking the crown of Meme. Taking the crown of all these things. And we want the big one too. The big one of uh, North Carolina. We're coming for that crown too. Amen. How many are ready to be kings? You want to take over. See, I need to take over. Hallelujah. Glory be to God in this place. So now you have, you, you realize the difference between a king and a priest. And can we move a little bit into another level? Let's go to Galatians 4. Galatians chapter 4 verse 1. The Bible says in verse 1, now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differing nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. That means when the father appoints you, he's appointed to be an heir. Is appointing you to be a king. How many are ready for their coronation? One day we need to talk about the coronation of the king. Amen. Jesus had his coronation at River Jordan. And when he rose from the dead and he went to the king of kings, the emperor of the universe, he was coronated again. This time with all the crowns of the whole world. The first crown he was given was the crown over Israel. But Israel, according to Deuteronomy 15, was the emperor of the whole world. According to Deuteronomy also, was the emperor of the whole world. When Israel, when Jacob fought with God, it says you have fought with God and with man, and you have what prevailed. Therefore, your name is what Israel. The word Israel means to rule with God. The Bible says that when the Most High divided the world, he divided according to the sons of Jacob. So everything pivots around Israel. Amen. So if you are to win over the whole world, you must win Israel. Amen. Israel is the crown of the whole earth. Amen. So Jesus had to come to Israel. He came to his own, his own world. Amen. But to them that would receive him, to get the crown of the whole world, he had to first come to the seat of authority. Mm -hmm. Did God not say that I gave you guys the kingdom? And you guys messed it up? Now I'm taking it from you. Now I'm giving it to other people. So the seat of authority is what is Israel. 
So when Jesus came there, he came to the king of the Jews. Who is he who is born to be king of the Jews? Amen. When he won that battle, he says, I'm going to die. But when I come out, much fruit will come. And the much fruit is the cross of the whole world. Hmm. Are, you, are you learning this? So if you want to expand your, your authority levels, you got to go out and win your Jerusalem. Win your Israel. Win your land. Go through rejection. Uh -huh. Amen. Don't slam in your face. Rejection opens the door Amen. to the other crowns that are yours. Amen. Paul tried to win Israel and almost died for that. And Jesus said, you must go very far from here. And when he left, he said, I made all the nations obedient by word and deed. To be an emperor, you must first be a king. Are you getting it? And as a king, you must win a jurisdiction. You must win a city. You must win a nation. Amen. And then that will give you the next level. That of an emperor. Amen. But you can never get here if you are still a servant. If you are a servant, where do you stay? You are in the household. Amen. You are Lord of all. Are you not the Lord? Galatians 4 verse 1. Say, I'm Lord of all. Lord. Is that not the king? Is. Lord is curious. Supreme in authority. And because he hasn't matured, he is subject to what tutors and governors. In those days when a king had a son, you remember that there was somewhere in the Bible, there was somebody called Manane, who was the foster brother to one of the sons of Herod. Well, there was a custom that the kings had, you know, other had sons, and the sons were given servants. And this servant will act with them like their friends. You understand this? Amen. So every son, every prince had a friend who was really a servant. And there was no difference between the two of them because the child was still a child. You understand this? And they were to grow up together. But at a certain level, the prince would be inducted into office. At that time, the friend can no longer hang with him like he used to. So the guy was around him just to bring him up. And when the prince is still young, he is given over to people, tutors and governors, who are to train him how to fight, how to behave as a king, how to act as a king. And he will never be allowed to rule until he, is, he comes to the place where the father can say, ah, the guy is not behaving as a king. Now come and become a king. Do you understand this? In the same way, as long as you don't mature, you remain as a priest in the house of God. Priests are servants of God. Amen? And a servant of God, glory be to God, their job is to edify the body. Perfect the saints. Say perfect the saints. Perfect means to mature, bring you to maturity until you come to the knowledge of the Son of God. That means to come into a place where God can say, ah, that is my beloved Son in whom I am when you get to that point, you are given the keys. And you can go and rule. So do you realize that Jesus never confronted Satan until he was given the keys? As soon as he became a son, and God began to speak that he is a son. As a son, what are you? You are an heir. You come into kingship. The next person he sees is Satan himself. Ah, you are the next king, man. Eh? It begins to try to take him down. And how does he try to take him down? Same way he takes down the kings today. He comes to his flesh. Hallelujah. So when you grow, you become wiser in the choices you make in life. Yes. Haven't you regretted some choices you've made in your life? I'm not looking at anybody. I'm not looking at anybody. Some choices have been interesting to say the least. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. But when you grow, you make wiser decisions. They have this one, wiser, I'm stronger, whatever. They're going to make you wiser. Amen. But until you get to the point where the father can say, ah, this person is ready to receive the crown. You are under tutors and governors. You are under the apostles, the prophets, 
the teachers, they will bring you up. We will bring you up and train to become what? Kings. The question is, when you become a king, what then? Many of us never get to that point. All we aspire to be is to be an apostle. The word apostle is very interesting, isn't it? Amen. There was a guy who came to this church. And he was like, God has called me to be under you. I said, okay. I mean, what, what can I say? Come to be. This person is much older than I am, maybe double, I don't know, but very older than I am. And I'm just a pastor, all right? And he's a bishop, which is a problem. But that I was so naive, I didn't even know it was a problem. Now, if somebody comes and they say they're a bishop, they're coming under me, and I come to the church, I'm like, okay, if you're going to be my son, you got to take that bishop out of it, out of because there's nobody bishop here. So if you're called a bishop and I'm called a pastor, then, then who is the head here? I mean, think about it. I mean, that's it. I'm, not, I'm not speaking here. I'm not speaking Frank stuff. But that time I was like, yeah, bishop, come and come and stay here. Yeah, sure. Come on now. The one day we were talking, he said, you know what? I don't know why God told me to come under you. Because you were a pastor. And um, you were an apostle. I said, my, my brother, I'm a pastor. So, <laughs> Yeah. If you want to, you want to beef me up so that I, you can come under me. Maybe I'm too short to come under under you. What is this? <laughs> Amen. He had all kinds of issues going on with him. His body was messed up. We prayed for him. He became totally healed, totally, completely healed. The pastor is healing the bishop. We went somewhere to preach, amen, and um, they, they tried to mess around with me at that place, you know, tried to get me to preach, so I said, ah, what's going on, so I said, okay, whatever, and then somebody began to manifest in a place, and they did their best, and the more they were trying to cast the devil out, the more the person was acting up, so finally the bishop turns to me, I said, oh, you want me? Okay. So I'll go there. In the name of Jesus, come out of here. Boom! They brought a bucket. He poured everything out. Immediately. Immediately. So the bishop can't stop, can't cast the devil out, but the pastor can cast the devil out. So what is the use of the title? Why are people so much into the title? What would the title do for you? Uh, eh? Okay, so I can't work okay, I'm no longer called Pastor Paul. But now I'm, I'm, I'm Bishop. Bishop. Amen. And the Bishop, the walking changes. Amen. And the way how to talk to has to change. Saints are in the house. Hey.
prophet emeritus. Yeah. And these are real titles out there because you, 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 you gotta do understand. Everybody calls themselves a prophet, and you call yourself a prophet. So, how can we see you? You have to put some people, some food for your sponsor. Amen. We were the ones saying that the Catholics were too much showy with their robes and all that stuff. Oh, we brought it into the church. And we add more flavor to it. And then we have this big fat hat. Amen. And then we, we wear all this stuff. And then we get the stick. Ah, hallelujah. We get a bishop stick. And then we walk. Hallelujah. And a big long cross. A golden cross. I mean, that's, 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 that's fine. I mean, if, if, if that's what will get you moving, that, that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. My thing is, is that all you want? No. Help me be a son. I want Jesus to call me a friend. The Bible says, convert the best gifts. If my father is being called a friend, I'm like, God, I want not that to do. You know, that's what I'm saying. I want to be a friend. A friend is more powerful than any priestly office that there is. Now, Jesus was a prophet. You know that. He was also a pastor. He called himself the good shepherd. He was also an apostle. He's called the chief apostle. Are you understanding me? He's also, a, I mean, he's, he's the most powerful evangelist there is. The Bible just went about all the cities and villages. Any title you can talk about, he, he performed it. He even became the ministry of health. He washed the feet of the, of the disciples. What did he do? Teacher, he was called rabbi. That was how they called him, rabbi, teacher. He performed all these roles as a son. Amen. As a son. Before he became a son, he was asking the priest questions they couldn't answer. And then he was answering the questions the priest couldn't even answer. Before he was called a son, he was flowing in the priestly gifts. But when he became a son, he became a king. I see the difference between the priest and the king. So as a priest or in a priesthood, it's great, but it's under the title of a servant. And brother and sister, servant is not the best thing. The Bible says, a servant abided not in the house forever. You got to grow from being a servant. Otherwise, your use is no longer there. A servant abided not in the house, but the son abided forever. So if the son sets you free, you shall be free indeed. If the servant tells you, oh, today you can sit on this chairs, but tomorrow it is removed from office, and you come and sit in this chair. They say, why is this in this chair? Oh, the servant told me to sit here. Oh, don't you know he has been fired? So if the servant sets you free, you're not free forever. But if the son sets you free, if he says you're free, it's over. I want to be a son because he's a king. And where the word of the king is, there is what? Is that he has a final say. How do you say to this word? Say, I'm a king. And a priest. But I'm a king first. And the king has more power, more authority than the priest. The priest is an added role. Amen. Are you getting it? So I'm not saying that don't aspire to be an apostle, don't aspire to be a prophet, don't aspire to be a teacher. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying that every star differs from another star in glory. One thing is brighter than the other. The king comes first, is brighter than the priest. The priest is added to the kingdom. Do you understand this? Amen? Amen. I want you to get this CD, listen to it until it gets into your mind. Because it's good to be a priest. Amen. Jesus as a priest, the Bible says he offered up prayers with loud cries and tears. When he hung on the cross, he offered his body for all the world. But when you go to Revelation 19, which we are going to end with, you see him as a king. Oh, my Jesus is a king. Amen. Amen. Revelation 19. Are you there? Yes. Verse 11. And I saw heaven opened. And behold, a white horse. 
He that sat upon him was called faithful and true. In righteousness, he doth judge and make war. Who makes war? The priest or the king? The king. His eyes were as a flame of fire. When you move into your killing identity, your eyes are not just eyes. They become flames of fire. You may not see to the soul, but in the spiritual realm, the demons see your eyes as flames of fire. It affects them. It moves them. It does something to them. Are you hearing this word? The Bible says that king, when he sitteth on his throne of judgment, scattered all evil with his eyes. And the Bible says, on his head, where how many crowns? Many, many crowns. Because in Revelation 11, verse 15, the Bible says that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. In 19, he accomplished it. May you have more than one crown on your head. At this point of my life, I'm not trying to be a king only. I'm trying to be an emperor right now. Amen. I'm telling you, I'm not the same. I'm trying to get other kingdoms. Amen. But to get other kingdoms, I must get this one right here. And what will prove that we have won Doro is when the media becomes ours. It's when the banking system is in our hands. It's when the school system is accepting our word. It's when the laws change to favor us. Amen. When what we say from this pulpit is the word that goes over the sea. Amen. When the seven hills, when the seven mountains of this land are taken, then we can say we have this land. Then we can move on and get other lands. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Are you hungry for a kingdom? Are you ready to take some other lands? A king goes out to fight. A king goes out to conquer other lands. A king doesn't just stay inside the house and sing Do re mi fa si, la ti do. Do ti la so fa mi re do. We thank God for hymns and melodies. We thank God for prayers. How long are we going to pray? How long are we going to sing? How long are we going to offer sacrifices? Where there's a Satan and a devil out there taking over the whole city. When you become a king, immediately your mindset is, I need a kingdom. I need to take over some land. That's the way a king thinks. A priest is like, let me, let me cover these ones. Let me make sure everything is safe. All you're doing is defensive. Just covering everything up, keeping everything close. Hey, hallelujah. Are you guys happy? Is everything fine with you? Are you okay? Oh, well, let's go work on this one. The, the, the devil lies in that way. But a king goes out to what you find. And let me give you a secret. The Bible says, resist the devil. Will he flee? Yeah. All right. Now, what mode do you think is more, more powerful than resisting the devil? Okay. The king. So if you're a priest, you're resisting the devil, right? But you're resisting a king in a priestly anointing. He's not going to leave you alone. He's going to be all over you. You wake up in the morning, he's dead. You go to sleep, he's dead. So you're always there. Ah, Father, help. But as a king, it's good to go on the offensive. You go into his area and beat him up and take his hand and he flees from you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I believe our position of authority and strength is from the kingship, not from the priesthood. Because all the priesthood will do is, oh, Father, give me a strong jaw to take the blows. Oh, the devil has been after me all the day long. Bless his holy name. So whose, whose name are we, are we blessed? Are we blessing the name of the, of the devil or the blessing of Look, when, when I hear a priest talk, I can, I, can, I can say, oh, the devil's been after me all day long. Oh, the devil's beat my brain up. Oh, the devil took my car. Oh, the devil took my job. Oh, the devil this. Oh, the devil that. Like, what, what in the world? But when you're a king, it's like, where, 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 where is the devil? I need the devil to kill. Where is the lion? Where is Goliath? I, I need some Goliath. Hallelujah. David is like, give me a Goliath. Give me a giant. Yes. The priest will run. A king is always looking for more territory. A king is after more land. 
A king wants to increase his territory. A king is always trying to increase his breadth of authority. He's always after more land, more souls, more people. Kings are not happy to just be in the house. Amen. And just, and just, just learn the next best song. Hallelujah. And get the next best robe. Hallelujah. And get the next best title. Hallelujah. No. A king is I need to get some land. I need to get some people. And the multitude of people is the glory of a king. Are you hearing me? A king goes out to fight. To get on that crowns. How many crowns will you have before you die? How many crowns will you have before you are translated out of this realm? How many crowns are you going down with? He says you want 10, ta 10 talents and give you 10 cities. I'm, I, we, we need some countries. Yes, sir. Glory be to God in this place.